Lieutenant Colonel Vinman, were you pressured not to testify? Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vinman is the National Security Council's top Ukraine expert. He listened in on Trump's July call with Ukrainian President Zelensky, in which Trump asked Zelensky to investigate Joe Biden and his son. Vindman testified behind closed doors, reportedly that he didn't think it was proper to demand that a foreign government investigate an American citizen. The House Democrats announced today they'll hold a formal vote this week on the impeachment probe following complaints from Republicans. But Trump's office just put out a statement saying the vote does nothing to change the fact that it's, quote, an illegitimate sham. Aaron Blake is a senior political reporter at The Washington Post. He joins us now from Washington via Skype. Hi, Aaron. Great to see you again. Hi, Bashi. Can we start off with these proposed rules and guidelines that the uh, Democrats revealed today? What should we know about them? Well, basically, we should understand this as an effort to take an argument away from Republicans. Uh, basically, Republicans have reverted to not really defending President Trump on the substance of the accusations against him in many ways because uh, the things they have defended him on have fallen apart over time as the evidence has come out. Um, so given that they're focused more on process, the Democrats are trying to take that argument off the table. And I think what we're going to see later this week, and we're still learning about exactly what this is going to look like, is that Democrats are basically going to try and run this process about as similarly as, uh, as they can to what Republicans did back in the 1990s with Bill Clinton and what Democrats did back in the 1970s with Richard Nixon. So if the process looks very similar to those things, uh, they reason, then Republicans are going to have to account for the actual substance of the arguments that are being made. Do you think that will actually happen? I think that Republicans are going to find any way possible to talk about the process here rather than the substance, because the substance is so difficult for them. And also not just because of that, but also because a lot of them just don't have much faith in the idea that this is going to head in a good, good direction. A lot of them came out initially and said that there was no quid pro quo with the Ukrainian government, and now that has fallen apart. Today is the fifth time we have had uh, a person of substance in this situation testify or talk about the fact that there was a quid pro quo. So even to the extent Republicans are willing to go there and willing to defend the president on the substance of the accusations, it's a very difficult thing to do, given that they don't have a whole lot of faith uh, that it's not going to get worse before it gets better. I want to ask you about that individual that you mentioned who testified, uh, Colonel Vindman. Uh, who is he and, and what, what do we know about what he had to say? Well, as mentioned, he is the first witness testifying here who actually was on that phone call with the Ukrainian president on July 25th. Certainly we'll want to learn what he might have heard on that call that maybe we didn't see in the rough transcript that we saw. But we do have a rough transcript, so we pretty much know what was said on that call. We know that people were concerned. I think the more significant thing uh, that Vin Vindman brings to the process is, one, uh, what he talked about when it came to a July 10th meeting, that was two weeks before the phone call with Zelensky, where he described National Security Council officials, including himself, getting very upset by the arrangements that were being made with uh, the Ukrainian officials. Basically, they felt like this was a quid pro quo at that moment, and they raised concerns about that immediately. The second thing that he brings is a profile. Uh, there have been many career professionals who have testified here. Uh, the president and his supporters have been willing and often have decried them as being partisans or never Trumpers in the, is the, the more frequent phrase that the president has used. Mm -hmm. uh, Vindman is somebody who comes to this. He is a longtime army officer. He has served in both administrations, Republican and Democrat. And not only that, but he is an Iraq war veteran who was awarded the Purple Heart after being hit by an IED in Iraq. So uh, there was some early attacks on him, uh, even some suggestions that maybe he has dual loyalties given that he was born in the Soviet Union. But what we saw as the day progressed was that many Republicans tried to talk their party against, uh, talk them out of rather going after him on character grounds because they just worried about just how bad that would look. We did see the president, though. I think he referred to him, I, not by name, but calling him a never Trumper witness in a tweet, right? Yeah, he's, he, that's what he said about the, the big witness last week, Bill Taylor. I think it's a pretty generic descriptor. But also, even that's a tough argument to make, given that this is somebody who uh, has served in, in administrations on both sides as, as an Iraq war veteran, as I mentioned. Uh, as, you know, He came into the hearing today wearing his full military regalia. Uh, I think that that argument is maybe has paid dividends in certain ways. 
but when it comes to somebody like Vindman, it becomes much more difficult to argue that he's some kind of uh, political operator ma masquerading as an army veteran. Do you expect when the hearings go public, it will be a game changer? And if so, in what way? I think that the Democrats are getting some of the very significant witnesses out of the way behind closed doors for a very significant reason. And that's because they didn't want the, the witnesses to be able to coordinate their testimony, especially if they weren't necessarily willing uh, participants. Once they have that basis, once they have the main witnesses out of the way, I think they can open the process up a little bit more and not be worried about it kind of devolving. They'll know that they have the basis for the impeachment process and they can kind of take it from there. So uh, I, I think that the way they've handled this has been difficult, but I think ultimately they have gotten a lot of things to work with uh, moving forward. And once it goes public, then uh, all bets are off. And just before I let you go, the vote that's going to happen, what exactly will that entail and what are you watching for? Well, it's going to be really interesting because the Democrats at first even avoided calling this an impeachment inquiry. They, they worried about what that would mean for members in swing districts, even Democrats in districts that President Trump won in 2016 and the tough spot that it would put them in. I think by and large, the party is almost completely on board with this. I would expect there to be a party line vote with basically all Democrats voting for it, all Republicans voting against it. Uh, but the real question with Republicans is not what House Republicans do, but what Senate Republicans do. If the House votes to impeach, this goes to a trial in the Senate. A lot more Senate Republicans are holding their, uh, keeping their powder dry rather, not committing either way, saying that they're going to be jurors in this Senate trial and that they basically don't want to commit either way at this early juncture. So uh, I think the Senate's going to be a much different animal than we're seeing in the House right now, which is generally much more of a partisan body. All right, I'll leave it there. Thanks a lot, Aaron. Appreciate your insights as always. That's Aaron Blake, senior political reporter at The Washington Post from Washington. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.